Welcome to Accelerated. I'm your host, Vitaly Golem. On this second season of the podcast, we are hearing from some of the global leaders in everything electric and autonomous, moving us quickly into the future. On this episode, we speak with Monica Mikak, the Chief Business Officer of QEV Technologies, one of the companies that helped launch Formula E electric racing, develop many vehicles from major OEMs, and is electrifying bus transportation across developing countries. Before joining QEV Technologies to lead its business operations, Monica was a member of the founding team at Remac Automobili, maker of the all-electric and fastest production car in the world, the Nevera. There, as the Chief Operating Officer, she helped grow the company from eight crazy kids in the Croatian garage to hundreds of employees in a very respected place in the global automobile industry. We talked about how she accidentally went from dreams of being a journalist to building a career in the auto industry, the early trials and tribulations of Remac as a startup, creative fundraising, electric racing, and why QEV's mission of electrifying public transport is so important. Here's our conversation with Monica. Welcome, Monica, to Accelerated. Thanks for taking the time. Where do we find you today? Pleasure joining you from Zagreb. Well, very nice place to be. I'll be there later this year again. Uh, love Croatia. Fell in love with it uh, since, since I got to work with you primarily. I uh, got to visit Croatia quite a bit. So um, you come from a place not known for the auto industry, right, Croatia? And you didn't intend to work in the auto industry. How did you end up here? It's, it's a strange story. I studied journalism and public relations um, and I worked actually on television. And soon I realized that most of the work that you do on TV is not really what I dreamed of. Um, I was always dreaming about doing investig- investigative journalism and uh, that's, that's sometimes really hard to get into it. Um, especially in Croatia, there were not many things, you know, not, not many noble journalism going on. Um, so I was always looking for, you know, new opportunities and uh, I met Mate and at that time Mate was actually having a project in his garage and just a dream. And uh, when I saw what he was doing and uh, when he told me about what he's dreaming to do in the future, I really loved the idea and I never doubted uh, for a second that this will be a success story. So basically, uh, when I met Mate no, from no Remek Automobili, that was my entrance uh, to the automotive industry. Although at that time, um, Mate was not really uh, well known in the automotive industry. So that those, those were beginnings. Very, very interesting beginning. Uh, it's, a, it's a true startup garage story, except in the auto industry. So we'll come back to that in a second. I wanted to ask you, though, um, kind of more on, on your personal perspective. Uh, today, there are a number of women in the auto industry, including most notably probably Mary Barra, the CEO of General Motors. How is it for you to be still you know, part of this such male-dominated industry, especially in Europe, probably more than U.S. still? At the beginning of my career, I uh, noticed this. Uh, I, I noticed that you know people were not taking really serious. Uh, what am I doing here? You know, a young lady, and especially when you're uh, going at Geneva Motor Show or Frankfurt Motor Show, and you have all of those big OEMs, and most of the time they would think that I'm a hostess over there. <laughs> but soon they would approach, uh, and when I started talking and. And uh, sharing my view on the industry, sharing what we are doing in Remac Automobili at that time, um, they would uh, change their mind. And um, somehow um, I, I really didn't even notice. And now um, I know a lot of people in the automotive industry, so I don't even really feel that there is some issue because I'm a lady. So for me, it's completely the same. For me, it's completely fine. And I enjoy working with mostly men. Uh, uh, for me, it's somehow easier. Interesting, interesting. Well, you, you do have, uh, you know, you're not a pushover. I know you well, so um, you definitely um, occupy the, the space you dominate there. So um, let, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the Remat story. So, uh, by the way, I mean, in, in the press uh, worldwide, it's called Remac, but really the Croatian pronunciation is Remats, right? Exactly. So how did the company get started? Let's talk a little bit more about that. And, and how did, what was your role and, and kind of how did you develop in the company there? It's quite a long story. Um, so everything started... Uh, 
from a garage. Uh, Mate had this idea that he wants to create the world's fastest electric supercar. And he was actually at the beginning working on his old BMW E30. And the funny thing is that at the beginning of Remac, uh, the company was not called Remac. The company was actually called uh, VTS, uh, like a formula for velocity. Um, you know, during those beginnings, uh, we decided, okay, for a change and maybe like um, all of the big companies are getting the names on their owners. So somehow we pushed Mate, although he was not a fan of the idea, but we pushed him like, let's call the company Remac, and that's how it stayed, Remac. So at the beginning, he was working on his uh, BMW E30. Um, he converted it to electric and he started winning the races uh, in Croatia. And that was covered by media. A guy that is working uh, for a royal family of Abu Dhabi noticed that and he approached him and Mate pitched the idea about the new supercar, that he, electric supercar that he wants to create. So that was presented to the prince of Abu Dhabi and he liked it and he wanted to order two cars. Um, you can imagine that at that time, uh, Mate said, like, look, we are in a garage. Uh, I'm not sure when are we going to be able to deliver those cars. And then uh, Prince asked, uh, how much money do you need to do it? Uh, of course, uh, we didn't know how much money we needed at that moment. Um, so we draw a number that was not uh, nearly correct of what we needed to create uh, where the company is today. Uh, but at that moment, actually, everything became really serious. And at that moment, we officially hired first people. Uh, we rented the proper facility, moved from a garage. Uh, and at that moment, uh, I was employed as uh, uh, handling public relations for the company. Uh, but you can imagine that in a startup company, you have to do whatever is necessary from the administration, uh, from the financial part, uh, uh, from uh, logistics, uh, and even assembling batteries before Frankfurt Motor Show because we didn't have enough people in the company. Um, we, while the company was growing, also my role was growing. So at the end, uh, I was uh, chief operations officer. Uh, but still, um, like in any startup, I was really covering many different roles. So beginning 2018, when I was leaving, um, five people were hired to replace uh, everything that I was covering in the company. True really replaceable yeah i mean just just uh you know in in the history books of startups and this is you know much closer to a silicon valley startup story than it is to an automotive story what you just talked about um there's always uh you know this big cultural shift when the company goes from family size to becoming a, a little nation state with hundreds and then thousands of employees so that's uh that's an interesting story but um you know, in the early days, EVs were not so fashionable. I remember we uh, we worked closely on on that first real funding round, and uh, it definitely wasn't easy. And the company went through some through a lot of struggles. What kept you motivated? And what kept the team motivated? We really had a lot of ups and downs, um, and. Um I think for me, there was no external motivation. It was always coming for, you know, from my internal motivation. And I, I never, if I want to do something, I never quit. It doesn't matter how hard it is. Um, I always like to say when you hit the rock bottom, you just need to push up harder and you will swim to the surface. So uh, this is something that I'm guided always in my life. Uh, and uh, I really believed in the project. Uh, and it, also Mate has... Um, has this strength and vision, what he wants to do, uh, and he really never backs up from that vision. Uh, he might expand, you know, might include new things, but uh, he really can bring the motivation to the whole team with ideas that he wants to do. Yeah, the strong vision of leadership is uh, is is something that's rare, and uh, I agree with you. I, I would compare Mate to uh, to a Steve Jobs type of character and uh, he's been able to uh, also grow um, into you know a very capable manager and he's never, I don't think he's ever worked for anybody he's kind of self-taught and started when he was what 17 
So it's uh, it's very very impressive, still. But um, let, let's keep going on 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 other topics here. And um, you know, operating in Europe, uh, it's quite interesting. There's uh, traditionally there's been a lot of support from various EU funds. Um, and government funds um, in different countries and different regions for different development programs, and you've been quite uh, you you've became become quite a pro at going after those type of funds. What have you learned through that experience, kind of working with different uh, governments and economic development funds? So I would say in general, um, European startup industry, it's not so progressive as US, especially when we started in 2010, it was extremely hard. Um, there were some smaller grants uh, where you could apply and get, uh, you know, smaller financing. Uh, but for the startup in automotive industry, you know, when you get a grant of 300,000 euros or 500,000 euros, that, that's, that's not enough for everything that you want to do and everything that you need to develop in the company. Um, of course, um, when the industry in the whole world progressed, uh, I think even the market in uh, Europe changed. Uh, so there were more and more uh, grants available uh, on the European level to apply. Um, it's, it's a hard process. Uh, it requires a lot of paperwork, a lot of... Uh, um, a lot of hard work, you know, to prepare everything and a lot of hard work even to, to justify the money that you're receiving from the government and uh, um, all the work that you're doing to justify the process. So it's definitely hard work, but I see more and more... Uh, more and more progressed on that side and uh, I see that uh, getting much easier for the startups that are coming in at the moment. I'm really excited to share something a long time in the making with you. My first online course. Over the years, I've trained thousands of founders through my book, Accelerated Startup, and my infamous Pitching Like a Boss workshops and keynotes. Like I've done for thousands of founders, I will teach you how to pitch like a boss. And for the first time ever, I will be doing it in a cohort-based online course. This is the world's most comprehensive and intensive course for entrepreneurs and future founders on pitching. It will help you craft the perfect pitch for investors and customers. It will also help you master public speaking. Get funded, communicate your vision to grow your team and dramatically improve sales of any product. Check out golem.net slash pitching. That's golom dnet slash pitching for more information. See you there. Now, the European auto industry uh, has been a big player and with government incentives now and a big push and EV not being a secret anymore, let's say, not being too early anymore. Um, you know, China has been pushing on EV, Europe's been pushing on EV, US is starting to uh, much more. What have you seen in Europe uh, as far as the changes in the automotive industry in the last, uh, you know, this decade that you've been involved, especially with the attitude towards electric vehicles? I would say that Europe was the last one to catch up with all of the changes happening. Um, China was really progressive and started very early. Uh, in America, you had Tesla. Um, and Europe was taking it a bit slow. I think my experience working with uh, big OEMs from Europe, um, those are huge giant companies and they are really slow when it comes to making certain changes. Um, at the beginning of uh, a work in Rimac Automobili, we discussed with BMW, but you know, for them, what we were doing um, was not at all on the radar. Um, only in the recent couple of years, uh, things started to move. And I think that now Europe is trying, pushing really hard and trying to catch up with all of the lost time they had before. So I see that Europe is now going forward really strong 
uh, and uh, you have a lot of subsidies for buying electric vehicles. All of the governments are pushing for buying electric vehicles. Um, all of the governments uh, have regulations that they want to see only electric vehicles in the city centers. And all of the manufacturers made that shift in their strategic planning, and they have certain deadlines, you know, 2025 or depending on the manufacturers, when they want to completely stop producing gas power cars. Yeah, I see a push uh, globally, and then uh, Europe is, uh, is quite a powerhouse with all the different classic brands. Uh, Volkswagen, notably, is, uh, is ex really accelerating their, their EV development, so we'll see if they become... Uh, a leader by volume faster than anybody even expected. Many big OEMs, uh, they actually uh, just recently created uh, their own uh, investment entities uh, because they noticed that they need to invest in a smaller more agile companies to be able to keep up with all of the developments and uh, progress and new technologies. And that was really missing uh, at the beginning when we started in Remac Automobili. Yeah, absolutely. And then venture and corporate venture has actually set records all over Europe in the last, you know, since 2020. So it's great to see that Europe is getting a little bit more uh, comfortable with risking on new startups and uh, new tech and, and, and going in and being less conservative, uh, chasing these dreams. Um, so that brings us to QEV Tech. Tell us a little bit about QEV and what got you excited enough to uh, to forego your your break, your sabbatical you're planning to take and, and switch right from Remac to QEV back in 2018. Basically 2018, since I worked really hard in Remac Automobili for first three years, no vacation, no single day of vacation, um, I wanted to take a, a longer break. Um, that was my plan. Uh, but I knew the CEO of QEV Technologies and he was asking me for a long time to visit them. And in my busy schedule, there was not never really time. So um, he called me and he told me like, look, now you, you don't have excuse. You have to come and visit what we are doing. So basically I visited QEV Technologies and I really liked the team and I really liked what they are doing. So on Friday I stopped working in Remac and on Monday I was working in QEV Technologies. And what made me uh, fall in love with the company, um, beside the people working there, and which I think is always uh, really important to work with a really good team, um, I love the idea. Basically, the company started uh, from electric racing. Um, and I would say that the company is currently leader when it comes to electric racing. We are active in all of the electric racing series that exist currently in the world. Uh, so there is a Formula E uh, where we are also active and we actually, where we actually won the first championship of the Formula E um, with Nelson Piquet. Um, we are active in the Extreme E and we are active, active in Junior Rallycross Championship, which we are actually leading the whole championship and organizing the whole championship. And we use the technology that we develop uh, in the racing side and we apply it to the projects uh, in the automotive industry. So for automotive industry, we can offer from the first design until the finished product, product and even a small series production, we can do everything in-house. And then we realize that all of that technology could actually have more mass market impact. So this is uh, where the area of electric buses started. Actually, everything first started in Philippines um, with their jeepneys, mini buses that are driving around Philippines and that are polluting heavily. Government wanted to change that, but they didn't have solution what to do with those minibuses that are polluting so much and that are actually the main way of transportation for many Filipinos. So we came to the idea that we can create a conversion kit uh, and that those vehicles could be converted to electric. Um, we made a first prototype in 60 days uh, and of course that was not you know something ready for production but it was enough to show to the government that it's possible and there were video videos uh, of uh, all of the ministers of Philippines driving in this electric jeepney and their push that they, they want to continue with electrification. Uh, at the end the project developed that uh, 
most of those vehicles are not really uh, mechanically uh, okay to be driven more on the roads. So the project developed forward and beside the electric kit, we have created electric platform that can be used for building the new buses on top. Uh, so we can offer either electric kit or electric platform to our clients. And that part excited me a lot because I noticed that uh, even emerging countries uh, uh, could have the opportunity uh, with smaller budgets, you know, to, to go forward with the electrification and to really push and make a huge change because in that way you can affect a lot of people. There is 300,000 of those jeepneys in Philippines and you have similar case in Peru where we are also uh, having a, a similar business where we are delivering platform for electric buses. Um, similar situation in Chile, similar situation in Colombia. So uh, a lot of markets that nobody really paid attention because everything everything was focused on what is happening in the uh, America or what is happening in Europe or what is happening in China. Yeah, it's great. I mean, uh, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot you gave me in that answer. I want to kind of take it piece by piece, but um, just QEV is doing, uh, you know, although the roots come uh, from racing, and I want to talk more about that, but uh, the main business now, as you described, is actually uh, providing electric mass transit, uh, which for a lot of these uh, developing countries are small buses. That's the primary transportation for everybody to get around. And cleaning up these giant cities with 10, 20, 30 million populations that are heavily polluted right now, it's really, uh, really dependent on converting that um, the, the mass transit to electric and uh, QV is doing its part there. So we'll come back to that in a second, but I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, racing and why, you know, classically this has been historically so important to automotive um, automotive brands, how to develop, uh, develop technology and, and build their brand through racing. Talk a little bit about that because you guys are a little different. You, you are, uh, you're, you're behind the scenes a little bit more behind these brands. You're supporting the teams and, and doing a lot of the work, but uh, let's talk a little bit more about that and, and what you've learned through formula E and extreme E this new season that just started and, and the other ones you're doing. Formula E was actually created uh, with the aim uh, to become a platform for development of new technologies for other OEMs. Um, and uh, since we had a long history before in the racing segment um, that was not electric, of course, because Formula E started uh, back in 2014 and before you didn't have electric racing series, but we had a lot of experience in the racing. And uh, we applied, of course, that experience and with the knowledge that we had uh, with electric powertrains, um, that was really a logical transition for us and we always believed uh, in the electric. And Formula E itself, they, they wanted to serve as a platform. And this is how we use the Formula E, because every season they allowed all of the teams to change certain part of the technology. So one season you could change motor and inverter, then another season you could change electronics. And uh, racing is really um, a rough environment, and in a short period of time you need to be innovative, create new technologies, and test them in the worst condi conditions uh, on the racetrack. Uh, so for us, those were really challenges and opportunities to develop new technologies. And I think also that's how you can see that Formula E developed uh, from having teams that were, some of the teams were not really connected uh, to the automotive industry. Uh, and then all of a sudden you had uh, all of the big manufacturers that wanted to join. Um, and you could see the change happening. Um, the biggest single shareholder of Formula E is actually also the biggest single shareholder of the Formula One. Uh, so obviously now Formula E is recognized as something that is coming to the future. So I really believe that in the future, more and more Formula E is going to be used some, somehow similar like Formula One has been used uh, by other big OEMs uh, for two reasons, uh, more technical developments uh, and uh, of course for promotional purposes. QEV has also developed vehicles for other manufacturers. Um, 
there are some really interesting projects or some really wild projects. Uh, maybe you can talk about Hispana Susa and some of the other things that that QV has developed. Yeah, so when it comes to work uh, for other clients in the automotive industry, um, Hispano Suiza is uh, definitely a project that uh, my team is uh, really proud of, uh, especially because the project comes from Spain. Hispano Suiza is a historic brand. Uh, well, it was really well known, and back then um, it supplied even technology parts for Rolls Royce. Um, and the brand, uh, uh, let's say, died. Uh, they were not producing anymore after World, World War. And the family that owns rights for the brand decided they really want to make a, revi a revival of the brand. And of course, uh, what can you do better if you're thinking for the future than, of course, going with electric? And again, it had to be something since Hispano Suiza was always um, way ahead with technological developments. Uh, that's how they wanted to create a supercar, more than 1,000 horsepower, something really unique, but still keeping um, a heritage of the previous brand. So if you take a look at the car, uh, you will notice that it really looks like uh, the Bonnet Xenia, uh, which was really a famous car of that era. And many even say that uh, when you look at the car, that it looks like um, it's not something that was designed uh, in history, but that was designed recently because it looks quite futuristic. Yeah, it's, it's a really kind of a revival of the Art Deco style. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's very interesting design, and um, and then QV has also developed vehicles for bike, uh, the China-based uh, massive OEM. Uh, so really interesting projects uh, got involved in. Besides besides cars, what else has uh, QV developed? Boats, airplanes, motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> In a, in a history, in a history of the company, if you take a look, we've really developed a lot of electric things, a lot of electric vehicles. We developed electric motorcycles. Um, we developed electric submarines as a project. Um, of course, those were mostly like one-off projects. Um, but yes, uh, we were covering many different vehicles. We didn't develop electric airplanes so far at least soon soon well very exciting and um on the bus business i mean that's really the main business for the company now and um we know that uh i know the company well so i, I know there's there's a few different angles but i would love for you to talk a little bit about kind of you you already talked about how you started with these conversion kits uh which are really interesting because they allow uh, a lot of these developing countries that don't have the budget to spend hundreds of thousands on each bus they can actually convert existing vehicles and electrify their fleets as well. But uh, going forward, you know, what's the, what's the vision? How is QEV different, and and what kind of uh, platform does QEV provide? When we are coming to the new market, what we try to analyze is uh, really, um, okay, let's check out the fleets they have, let's check out the vehicles, let's analyze the route those vehicles are driving, because sometimes um, the biggest expense uh, in electric powertrain is so far battery, and this is the thing that has to be optimized. So if we analyze properly the route, then we can really say what is the... Uh, optimum battery to have in that kind of vehicle and how to design route to have fast charging station at certain point and what is needed for this vehicle to go through the day. Um, and uh, we want to offer full service to our clients. So basically from this electric platform on which they can build the, the bus on top uh, until analyzing the route, until all of the system for following and tracking the buses. Uh, and even if needed, we offer supporting charging infrastructure because when you're entering markets um, like uh, those development the countries in development, uh, they don't have uh, developed infrastructure. So you need to really offer a whole solution. Uh, why we are also really unique because in most uh, countries like Peru or Philippines, you have many uh, bus or minibus manufacturers. So there is no, uh, let's say, monopoly. Uh, and there are a lot of small players. 
And now all of a sudden, if government decides that they want to buy a fleet of electric buses, let's say from some of the Chinese manufacturers uh, like BYD, uh, it means that all of those manufacturers of local buses would lose their jobs. And there will be a lot of people, you know, that would stay uh, without the job and uh, economy could suffer from it. Uh, so here is where we come in and we offer a solution with offering electric platform or electric kit on which those local manufacturers can easily build body and interior on top. Um, also, that way uh, governments can say that the product is built locally, uh, which helps uh, a lot when it comes to different subsidies that are organized on a national level. Um, and uh, so far we are actually the only company that offers a uh, platform for those manufacturers that want to switch their work to electric. Uh, I'm sure in the future you will have more like, for example, um, a Volkswagen Group uh, before offered platforms for uh, buses, uh, gas-powered buses to be built. I'm sure they are going to come uh, with new platforms in the future, but I think that the market is huge and since we are one of the first companies uh, starting in this market, I think there is really a great opportunity. It's fantastic. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that because uh, as much hype as the passenger vehicles and the different brands get, um, for a lot of the world, you know, they're not going to be buying hundred thousand dollar, hundred thousand euro luxury electric vehicles. Their their life is going to be dependent and much improved with uh, clean uh, EV buses that are accessible and and economic and and arrive soon. That's a big quality of life issue for for a lot of people around the world. So that's that's a fantastic thing that uh, QV is doing uniquely. When companies start to catch fire and blitz scale and look for capital to fuel that growth or look to find the right exit strategy, they often seek the counsel of investment bankers. At Drake Star Partners, we work with some of the leading companies in global tech on capital raises, M&A, corporate carve-outs, SPACs, and much more. And we're pretty good at it. Our team of over 100 technology sector experts across nine offices in six countries is comprised of not only career bankers, but experienced executive venture investors and technologists. Drakestar Partners is the number one ranked and fastest growing mid-market investment bank across US and Europe. While I focus on mobility and energy transition sector, along with all things Silicon Valley, my partners from the Pacific to the Atlantic and around the world lead in software, media, communications, and everything in between. Learn more about us at drakestar.com. What's it like for a European company to work so heavily with uh, within China and Southeast Asia? I mean, China is, is so difficult for outsiders to, to work with. You know, how have you managed that and what have you learned about uh, doing business in that part of the world? I always like to say if, um, if my mother pushed me to learn Chinese when I was really young, uh, I would now be uh, a billionaire <laughs> uh, because uh, it would be it would make my life so much easier. <laughs> um, and we at QEV Technologies realized that the only way to really make a, a proper business is to hire uh, team members uh, that are from China and of course that speak English. So that that's a bar barrier how we are managing uh, all of those big uh, Chinese. Uh, clients that we have uh, and honestly I think, think that's the only way um, to really um, to really understand better uh, if you have somebody in between somebody on your side but somebody who really understands uh, who understands the culture and who understands uh, what is going on behind the project yeah, very, very important. Well, you've been so gracious with your time. I really appreciate it. I wanted to ask you one last question. You already kind of hinted at the answer, but knowing what you know now and the fact that you went from journalism, you're still, you know, you're, st you're, you're still young. Your career is just uh, really getting going and you already accomplished so much. Um, what advice would you give yourself at the beginning of your career? Would you have done anything differently than you've done so far? I think that we always learn from our mistakes and I think when it comes to business, when, when you know the outcome, of course, you would do certain things differently. Uh, 
Um, but I'm happy with how my career developed. And it's really hard to summarize, like, okay, what do I say to myself as uh, one thing um, besides learning Chinese? <laughs> uh, I, I would point out maybe three uh, important things. Uh, one that I really learned is that you need to change yourself because that's the only way to progress. And sometimes it's really hard to change yourself. And I always like to say then, try harder. Um, the second one would be uh, to slow down in order not to burn out. Um, there is a thin line between uh, working really hard and maintaining a private life and consequences that come to your health if you're not balancing properly. I'm still learning how to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and uh, there is advice that I got uh, from a very dear friend, uh, uh, former Fo Formula One driver, Adrian Campos, that recently passed away. Um, he told me that he started to achieve the best results when he realized that the biggest enemy on the racetrack uh, is himself. And that is so true in everyday life. Um, so I, I try to remind myself about that frequently and uh, uh, try to see what is going on in my life and, and how to really uh, keep up of what am I doing and how am I doing it. Now, very last question, because you brought this up a couple of times. Are you teaching your uh, one-year-old daughter now uh, Chinese? <laughs> Not yet. We started with English, <laughs> but I already told to some dear friends that I have in China, I told them like, look, as soon as traveling allows us, uh, when we meet finally, you, you can only speak Chinese to my little girl and that's it. <laughs> This was our conversation with Monica Mikak, the Chief Business Officer of QV Technologies and former COO of Remac Automobili. I hope you enjoyed this episode and don't forget to give us five stars on your favorite podcast platform and of course share with your friends. See you on the next one. And in the meantime, you can always find me at golem.net.